Hi, everyone. Welcome to Melissa and Lori Love Literacy. Today, we can't wait to talk about sound walls from an expert who's been talking about them for a very long time. You might even know who it is already. It's Mary Dahlgren is here with us today, who is a teacher at heart. She has over 25 years of experience in education, and she's currently the president of Tools for Reading. Welcome welcome to the podcast. Thank you all so much for inviting me to come and speak today. And I I've got to get my updated bio on there, but I actually, it's been 40 years of teaching. 40 years. Oh, my. <laughs> and uh, another thing to know is that Tools for Reading is now a 95% group company. That's so, great. Uh, yeah, we have some some big changes that occurred last year, and we're just growing and growing, and, and um, it's exciting to see all the work that's being done. Yeah, that's congrats. awesome. That's great. Yeah, congratulations. Thanks. All right, so we're going to jump right into the content here. We know our <laughs> listeners want to know all about sound walls. It's a hot topic, and I'm hoping you can start us off just by telling us what are sound walls and how they're different from word walls. All right. Well, let me start uh, first with how did I end up creating sound walls? Is that okay? Just oh my gosh, away. yes, please to help people kind of gain some insight into what the work is around and about, and um, the the why and the how. I I was a national letters trainer for 18 years. I I mean, my dream was when I was in graduate school to work with Louisa Motes. And I was fortunate enough to get to do that, became a letters trainer. And there were about a dozen of us for a number of years that worked together. And then that kind of dwindled down to about seven or eight. And anyway, but many, many years of teaching um, and many um, weeks in a row, I would go in and work with school districts and teach them about the the 44 phonemes of our language. That's um, part of our letters training and the phonology, learning about the consonants and the vowels. And one for me, when I, I actually went to the Greenwood Institute in, in the mid 90s to study with Louisa, and I learned about these charts. And one of my huge ahas was the fact that I was teaching sixth grade at the time. And I, um, I had kids that, that made all these weird spelling errors. They would write a J for a ch sound. So this, instead of a CH, they'd write a J and, um, instead of DR, they write a J and or TR, they write a CH. And I'm thinking, you know, my, my response to the kids at that point was you obviously didn't study, write the words five times each, nothing to do (laughs) with, with really giving corrective feedback because I did what I had been taught. right? Right. And that tends to be the way of education. Often we tend to fall back on how we were taught. But then I learned about the, the consonants and the vowels and how those two sounds the ch and the j sound are made in the same place in the mouth. Children easily confuse them. The children are actually the linguist. They're the ones that are thinking about these sounds and hearing these things, and they're trying to write them down. While I was completely visual, right? I just, I knew the spellings. I had no idea how phonology impacted how children wrote and um, how they had, why they had confusions about things. So that was my first real insight and the value of, of understanding why it's important to actually be aware of all 44 speech sounds rather than just 26 letters, right? And I, and I still had a, had a word wall, but then the more that I, um, I taught and I worked with the charts, I began to realize, you know, if we, if we taught all 44 speech sounds and came at that, from that perspective, then rather than the 26 letters, it would really make more sense for kids. It doesn't always make sense for us as teachers and adults because the way that we've always done things. But this whole idea of if there's 44 sounds and then there's multiple ways to spell those sounds, if I know the sound and then I can use my sound well as the resource to say, now what are my choices for spelling O? for example. And, and then in a classroom, what have I been taught? I've learned that O might be in a word like no or go, 
open syllable, or I learn O consonant E. And maybe that's at the beginning of first grade. And then I learn OA and OW, and I, I begin to understand what my choices are. But as I know the sounds, and children tend to, and I, and I base this around Becky Treeman and Charles Reed's research that they did in the, the 70s and 80s on um, preschoolers writing errors and really beginning to see kids are thinking about these things. They're trying to figure out the sound because if they knew how to spell the word or they knew where to look on a word while they, they go there. But if I have a sound, they're more likely to come at it from that perspective. So um, may, just learning to make the shift from word walls to sound walls has been um, something I've seen. I, spread across our country. It's kind of been interesting how it's spread like wildfire. But my my colleague Antonio Fierro and I decided, well, we're going to take our, our charts that we use in letters and we're going to make them come alive by using children's mouth pictures, you know, things that kids can identify in classrooms so that they can begin to compare what are their what does their mouth look like when they're making that sound and is that the is that the sound that they're trying to produce? And then again what are the choices? So really getting teachers to think about, it's not just the um, the first letter, and I think of a word, and I use examples in, in my talks when I show us a word wall that has, um, for example, under the letter T, easiest one to talk about, they, the, that. You know, why do kids right. say to he and to hat? Because they think when anything's posted under the letter T, it's a T sound. But why aren't we teaching the F and the V sound, right? The TH sounds, because kids have to read the right from the start, the get-go. So why not teach them those things? So those are, it's probably a longer answer than you wanted, but uh, thinking about the sound walls and word walls and, and how, you know, why why did we start developing them really to to start thinking about things from a child's perspective and making along with making sense of the language. Yeah. So sound walls help kids see sounds, right? See sound, yes. See, sounds. see the sounds, see the sounds and spell the sounds because it's really, and I, and I know, um, especially in a, in a couple of States where they really tried to kick off sound walls. Um, oftentimes people would say, well, it's, you don't add any print to it. Well, you can't read if you don't have the print. <laughs> so that was a misconception that occurred. So I, I feel like, you know, things are, are getting straightened out. And, and yeah. So would you mind just giving a rundown, Mary, of like, you know, if, if I had no idea, my, my administration says, you need to start using a sound wall. And I'm like, I never even heard of it. I don't know what to do. Can you just give a rundown of like, what should be on a sound wall? Uh, okay. Well, first of all, I'd say make sure you attend a training or <laughs> coaching or something. One hundred percent. It's not just a, it's not something that we naturally do. So, what's on a cell wall? Cell wall is made up of two parts: a consonant chart and a vowel valley. And so, to represent all forty-four speech sounds. And I tell teachers because they start to panic about wall space. They don't take up much more room than a word wall does. But I tell teachers, you can have the ch consonant chart in one place in your room and the vowel valley in another place. We um, we really look at, and again, uh, the linguistic perspective, the, the speech language pathology perspective of how do we produce sounds in our language? How, what is the, the, um, the place and manner of articulation? Where in your mouth do you um, produce those sounds? And then what happens with your airflow and your voicing and things like that? So those are two main organizers on the consonant chart. And again, as a teacher, appreciating the fact that, okay, so the way we have this, the sound wall set up is by the front of the mouth. So the first sounds listed on the sound wall are the P and the B sound, which we use um, the P and the B to represent those sounds in print. And um, and then the mm sound. So those are all made with your lips together. And I tell teachers, you know, one of the things to notice is what do babies, what sounds do babies start making right from the beginning? The, yeah. Those sounds, the ma, 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 ba, 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 <laughs> pa, pa, pa. And then the da, da, da. What can you see the caretaker's mouth doing? And that's babies rely on that. I think it's so fascinating when you start thinking yeah, that's about really cool. that. 
Yeah. And you start thinking, wow, this is, this is how language begins to work and develop. But again, as teach, I mean, this is, it's so new to us as teachers and understanding, unless you've been through a, a speech path program or linguistics, really in-depth study. So understanding the why of how a sound wall is set up, and it is set up in a specific order in the consonant chart in the vowel valley, but because of the way the sounds are produced and from the front of the mouth to the back of the throat. And, and the setup also has to do with understanding when children make spelling errors, it gives me insight. And I'm going to use another example that often has to do with dialect and um, just my environment. So many of my kids say both of us or birthday bathroom, right? Instead of the TH, they use the, the F sound. And when you have a sound wall set up, the F sound and the F sound are right next to each other. Right. They're next door neighbors. Antonio and I call them, you know, where's, what's in your neighborhood? Where are your neighbors? Your next year, um, which who's, who's your roommate? And then who lives next door? And those two sounds easily confused, very common, also easy enough to, to talk to kids about how do we produce that sound and what does it look like in print and learning also. I've learned from people like Julie Washington, right? Um, we love about, her. And we love Julie Washington. <laughs> Amazing. And, but it's, I'm not going to say that you're wrong when you say both of us, right? I'm going to say, I know that's how you say it at home, but when you're reading and writing, you have to know the standard American English representation here yeah. and, and having that confidence to be able to do that with kids, but also being able to, I can show them why why they have that confusion. And I think that's also, that supports me as the teacher. I'm giving them that ladder for that scaffolding to, to build their confidence. And, um, and I'm, I'm not feeling like I'm making a judgment. This is how language works. Right. It's and probably so helpful I, to see that it's so close, you know, for the kids not just feeling like, oh, it's wrong. Right. It's like, oh, you're just like, you're just off by one, just right there. <laughs> right. And to be able to validate them and say, you know, it makes sense. And, um, and this is not uncommon for people to say. And, and um, so just, just being able to point that out. Yeah. That it's, that's, they're just right there and validating what they're thinking and doing and, and grappling with too. Mary, can you share a little bit about why they're neighbors? Like what makes them neighbors? I, 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 okay, I assume because sure. the and roommates, I, you said roommates too earlier. So that was, I was okay. curious for a okay. roommate example. <laughs> so, so, okay. I'll give you some examples and I'm going to use, I'm going to use the, those, those, um, phonemes that we call fricatives because they're, they're always continuous. So easy to start with in, in instruction because you can hold that sound longer. But for example, we always talk about the unvoiced and the voice. So these two sounds are, um, I start with my lips together and then I put my teeth on my lips. So this is the second column. And when I put my top teeth on my bottom lip and I blow, I get the uh, unvoiced sound, the sound as in fish, which is hard to hear in doing a, a talk like this because you can't see my mouth necessarily. <laughs> Or if I turn my voice on, I put my top teeth on my bottom lip and blow, I get the v sound, right? So those are roommates. They are, mm. They're produced in the exact same place in my mouth. The only difference between those two sounds are, is voicing. And I'll give you another example of, as a teacher, noticing when my students, and, and again, sixth graders would write E-F-R-Y for every, every. I mean, think about it. It's like, yeah. you know, when you say it in your head and even if you whisper the word, you can see why they might have a hard time with the and the v sound. Right. Those were huge insights for me. You know, F and V are nothing alike. They're not close to each other. They don't look alike. Why would a child write that? But then I begin to understand the phonology of the language and it, and then it makes sense. Oh, yeah. The sound again, is so similar. And it's probably not that they don't need more practice. Like they don't need reteaching in anything. They just need to, to under, or maybe they, I, I don't know yeah. what I'm hearing you say is they really just need to understand where these sounds are like, why these sounds are related, how they look when they're saying them. Would you say that that's a kid who needs 
I mean, if just this specific example, say that this is what we're seeing in a child, would they need reteaching or would they just need to understand this idea? No, I don't think they, I don't think they need reteaching. I do. I think you're exactly right, Lori. It is um, just pointing it out, clearing it up and talk about immediate corrective feedback. I mean, I have the opportunity to do that, show the kids, I, they can see it right there and, and they can make sense of that. Yeah. So, and really um, we've been criticized a little bit for teaching articulation and spending too much time on that. We're not really teaching kids how to articulate the sounds. We're teaching them to notice how they're producing those things. And boy, the loss we had during COVID because of face masks. And I think that people really realized how much we rely on looking at your mouth and what you're saying. Right. And so, yeah, um, it's, it's very validating for kids. And that, that example of every E F R Y to E V E R Y, but understanding, um, as a teacher, like being able to give them that insight. So you don't say write the word five times. each. <laughs> That's not helpful at all. Right. But why did I <laughs> that error. So, okay, let me, let me take that. And one step further. So we've got the, the roommates, the F and the V sound or F and V, um, orthographically, and then right next door. So teeth on the lip, the next place in your mouth, moving this, uh, the sound a little bit further back is my tongue between my teeth. So if I put my tongue between my teeth and blow, and some people call these the naughty sounds, cause you're sticking your tongue out, right? The F and the V sound. So we were just talking about both or with, and the f sound is right next door to the th sound tongue between the teeth, the TH as in, um, we use the word feather because it's well, or, um, we use the word thimble as an example, as the unvoiced TH it's hard. It's really hard. Um, because most of our function words that have the voice TH, they, that, the, these, you can't put a picture on a card. So what's right. a keyword, right? <laughs> so keywords are really critically important when teaching that also. So kids have a reference when they're not sure, like, what am I doing with my mouth there? But I have a keyword to help me think about that sound and say that sound. And sure. then I uncover the print. I put the print on the sound wall as soon as I ta- I've taught the phonics concept. So, And then you can keep adding to it, right? So as they learn more absolutely letter pat letters and letter um, yeah. patterns that make that sound you can keep adding yes and so um, i was actually in a school yesterday and i was working with kindergartners and they had just learned that the s can also make the z sound Yay. so <laughs> we talked about words that we call what we call temporarily irregular as is has right that um they have that S on the end, but the S doesn't make the S sound, but the Z sound. And the fun thing was, is that I talked with these kindergartners about that. And I, I wrote those three words down and I said, now, you know, and we talked about the S and the Z, those are made in the same place in your mouth. What happens? What's the difference between those two? S-Z. My voice is turned on, my my teeth are close together, my tongue is touchy, is lifting up behind my teeth as I'm making those sounds, and they're continuous. So those are things we talked about to get them to notice them, but then talking about the voicing and then reading is, as, has together, blending those sounds together, and um, talking to the children. When you see these short little words, you have to try S as the Z sound. And, and that, you know, obviously our goal is to, the, the whole point of a sound wall is to build to automaticity and to begin to, what well, you know, it's the steps to orthographic mapping, storing words in our visual word form area so that we, we can increase our fluency. It's not so that kids can tell me the 44 speech sounds. Right. It's a, it's a tool to, to move things along more effectively and more efficiently. So that's, that's such a, a good point. It's not like we just want you to memorize all of these 44 sounds. No, no, not (laughs) at all. And and again, I think there's misconceptions about the purpose of a sound wall. And, um, but it it really is to get to um, sight word automaticity and and to get to fluency. And do you mind if I take another little deep dive here with sound, with talking, so just talking about this and the sound with those children. I love this. Um, 
I so I couldn't just stop with is as has. We had to bring up cats and dogs, right? <laughs> so we were talking about. I said, you know, so and they they've been learning about plurals, and I said, so when you add an s, it means more than one, and we talked about that, and then I wrote the words the word cat. But then I said, what happens when you have one, more than one cat? The word becomes, and the kindergartners said cats. Yes. And so the idea that cat is unvoiced, t, 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 is unvoiced. So when I add the suffix s, my voice stays off. So it's cats, right? So it's that s sound. But dog, and when I have more than one dog, I have two dogs, mm -hmm. or I have 10 dogs, but um, the idea of dog, g, 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 is voiced. So my voice stays on when I have the plural and it's dogs. So now I have the z sound. You just I taught me something. I didn't even know that. I mean, it's it, the, so we say the le English language is morphophonemic. It's meaning based and it's sound based. And we're getting at that. And that's kindergarten, first grade understandings when I'm teaching inflectional endings and suffix s and then we can add in suffix ed it's the same thing that happens with ed for the t and the d or when does it say the id sound and um and even further when I start when I'm working with my older students and talking about prefixes on words and I I ask my kids why do we say words like impossible instead of impossible Right. So um, it's for ease of articulation. It's for ease of processing. So instead of saying impossible on my and I this is, you know, instructionally as I'm working with teachers, I talk about the the p and the m mm are in the same column together. It's easier to say impossible because my lips are together for the m mm sound because I need to prepare to make the p sound right. in the base word possible, right? That's when, you, when you'll see like lists of prefixes that mean the same thing, like, like you yes. just said, like what in and in. Chameleon oh prefixes, they adapt. There's nine chameleon prefixes and they adapt to um, join onto base words. So that the, the knots, um, impossible, illegal, irregular, right? So that, that prefix means the same thing, but it's being added to um, different base words. The same thing with C-O-N, right? Like connect and, um, uh, oh, I need a, a calm word, complex. Um, it, you know, having, having that prefix that means the same thing, but noticing, I don't have to learn meanings for all these prefixes if I can group them by those nine, um, chameleons. And then there's many others, but that's a, that's a big insight and quick, make it so quick and easy to learn. Also knowing our longer words, I'm going off in a diff, kind of a little different direction, but this is where we get, this is what I get excited about with sound walls is that. It's not just about phonology, it's about orthography and it's about morphology. And, um, but helping um, kids to understand how, how our words actually work together to, that for meaning, the sound and, and for spelling patterns. This is so amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to stamp too that, I mean, we already, you already mentioned all the reasons why it's, you know, would be more beneficial to have a sound wall than a word wall. But I'm just thinking as you're talking, like if, if you're just putting them up by the first letter, you miss all this rich conversation that you're talking about that we just went through. Like you can't have that if you're just putting it up by the first yeah. letter. Right, right. And yeah, if I'm just using the first letter and I'm not thinking about what's that, what's, what's the, what sound does that grapheme actually represent? Cause that's, that's a really important part of our, um, as a teacher insight and as a child insight and learning. Yeah. I'm also thinking too about, you mentioned that idea of, and I asked you about it, right? Neighbors and roommates, the whole time you've been sharing these examples, I'm thinking, and me as a grown adult now, right? I'm like, oh, is this a, are, are S and Z roommates? Like, <laughs> right. The, the, the sounds, the sounds, has right. are they roommates? Like, I just, am, I'm getting excited about it. Picturing a class full of students. <laughs> I imagine also getting very excited about trying to figure out what's what that's ex really exciting. Right. Or yeah. like 
you know, impossible. That's really hard to say with your mouth. Impossible is so much easier. Like, just kind of yeah. finding that out on their own is obviously you'd, they would want, you know, we'd want to teach that, but giving them the tools to be able to uh, figure that out and work and through be that curious on their own, about it too. Yeah, is really it's exciting. Cool. Yeah. And creating a curiosity. And, and, you know, the amazing thing is, is that I've been in, in so many classrooms and I, I have to give a shout out to Alabama classrooms in the state of Alabama. They've really embraced sound walls and getting to hear. And I, we're just waiting for some studies to come out because I know that's also a big question is, you know, where's the data and the research to show it, but we're seeing just in outcomes in classrooms. And so um, the anecdata, as we call it, uh, <laughs> instead of, you know, we have anecdotal information, but, but data coming in from, from, you know, in small, small numbers, but, um, having teachers say at Christmas time, there were kids that I know, um, I was going to have to ha refer to, uh, to be tested, but then they come back in January and things begin to click and they're using the sound wall as a resource and they're having conversations with their peers in the classroom and um, they're beginning to make sense of the language themselves. And my kids begin to take off and I don't have to refer those kids. And um, so it, it is like, and I, I talk about, you know, we've, we've learned so much about the neurology of reading and that um, thanks to you know, brilliant researchers like Stanislas Dehan and Marianne Wolf and talking about those neural networks that we build in our brain. Phonology is, is stored up in that front temporal lobe that's up by the my temple. And if I were pointing um, at my head and then that occipital where I begin to store print is all the way back in my occipital area, back by my, my ear, that, there's a distance there. And I've got to build those neural pathways. How do I make those connections for my students? I've got to teach about the sound and I have to teach the print. And then I have to make those connections. So this opportunity, and I, I'm going to say I was in, a, I was in two pre-K classrooms yesterday. And we were, we were talking about these things, playing with language, playing with words, thinking about sounds. And of course we did head, waist, knees, toes, and we stood up and, and, <laughs> and did typical phonemic awareness tasks jumped up when we said the whole word back together and, you know, fun things like that. So um, we're using the sound wall as that starting point, but it's part of teaching the phonology and getting down to phonemic awareness, which we know we need to get to the phoneme as quickly as possible, and then add the print to develop the alphabetic principle to move on into uh, deeper phonics instruction and more complex phonics. But we've got to start, if our kids can't do that, that first, um, that basic alphabetic principle and match that one sound to, to one letter, it's hard to build if they, if they don't have that starting point. Yeah. That's what I was thinking we could dig into a little bit more is what research or what theory support the use of sound walls. I know you had mentioned in our pre-call articulatory gesture research. Right. Um, but I didn't know if there's anything that you wanted to elaborate on other than that. So no, floor is I, yours. <laughs> I, I really, thanks. I, um, so when Antonio and I, um, began working on the sound walls, really building on our knowledge from letters, working with so many teachers and the work of Lene Aries research. So understanding, you know, that, that pre-alphabetic phase that children, that they come to us typically in, in, in kindergarten and pre-K. And how do I move them from pre-alphabetic to early alphabetic? What do they need to know and understand? And, um, and then moving from early alphabetic to later alphabetic, um, you know, what are, what are those, those um, what's involved in those phases? How do I move, help move a child from one phase to the next? So, so our, our work is oftentimes um, organized around Aries, work and her phases of reading development, reading and spelling development, but also um, her papers that, that she's written, which when you, when you go back, she's been writing about this type of thing with children um, for a number of years when, you know, in, in the nineties, 
I think possibly the 80s, but then papers from 2014, 2022, you know, this, this work and this fascination continues to grow. And, and while she didn't teach students all 44 sounds, they saw a benefit when they were teaching the children the sounds and the letters versus kids who were just taught letters versus kids who were doing business as usual, whatever they typically did in a pre-K or kindergarten classroom. So um, much of my work, we're, we're expanding on that. And, um, and as I said, you know, waiting, there are several people who are in their doctoral studies right now. And um, I think that they're, I know that they're working on putting together research studies to study how do sound walls have this effect and, and what is, what is the work behind it? And, um, which I think is important. I also think it's funny that, um, people always say, where's the research on sound walls? And I'm, where's the research on word walls? We use those forever. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> but it, yeah, there's, I, it makes me nervous when, when we saw sound walls blow up on the internet and that people think it's just about mouth pictures. That's right. And right. there's so much more to understanding the use of the sound wall, the phonology, the orthography, and then moving into morphology. I mean, there's, there's so many things that you can rely on and talk about in, in making those connections. So speaking of that, you mentioned earlier too, that, you know, the teacher, all, all of us, if we're using sound walls need to, have some knowledge in order to be able to use them. What would you say is what, what knowledge is needed and what are the best ways for teachers to get that knowledge if they don't have it already? Well, um, so, so understanding the organization of, of the charts and um, so I have to do a shout out. Many of our teachers have been through letters in the United States. So letters unit two, um, this information is is scripted out in there. We have a we have sound wall classes we offer, and they're six hour classes just to get teachers started and to begin to understand these things. And they're open. Um, they're posted on our Tools for Reading website, and so you can go and find those there or under ninety five percent group dot com. Um, there, we offer those those six hour classes to start with, and then um, we really like to to work with coaches that go back into the district to help them have a deeper understanding because it is, it's, uh, there's, there's some study. It's not just, it's not a quick and easy um, something to learn about, but I think strengthening teachers knowledge and depth of knowledge is, is so understanding and it's never too late to learn. Being, being a lifelong learner is really an important part of being a teacher. That's right. Yeah. Well, speaking of that, I, I know that so many of our listeners re that resonates with them. I, I know because they message us all the time and have so many amazing questions. Um, and I'm thinking of teachers who are listening, thinking, okay, I want to get started with this. I don't want to not take action, but I'm not sure I have all the knowledge I need in order to jump in right this moment. So how can we work this balance of okay, I need to learn more and I want to learn more and I'm learning, maybe I'm signing up for a course that's starting soon or I'm reading, I'm reading some of the tools for reading uh, stuff on your site. Right. But also, hey, the school year's, you know, in full swing. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I want to try this now so it doesn't feel overwhelming to me in, yeah. you know, August or September, uh, whenever I, maybe I, I do a, a soft launch of a, a sound wall, we could call that um, right now. What advice would you give to a teacher now? So I would, I would say, um, look at how a sound wall is arranged. Don't be afraid to take your words off your word wall, set up a sound wall. And the most important thing is, is that you take your words from your word wall and you talk to your students about what's the first sound. Where are we going to put these? Let's look at this new arrangement that we have. So I, I love the soft launch idea. And I, I encourage people all the time um, at this time of year to say, you know, try it out. It's, it's, um, it's certainly not going to hurt building your own confidence, getting the kids comfortable with that. But um, looking at learning how to set it up and then thinking about what is that first sound? How am I going? To, how are we spelling that in this word? What was our reason for putting it on the word wall? And um, but your students have to analyze it with you. It's not any good if I take it down 
if I take down a word wall, post a, a sound wall and just put the words up. The ki- you want the kids to be engaged in this. You want them to make decisions. And, and then there are funny things like the, um, our nasal sound that only comes in the middle or at the end of a word, the ng, as in sing, <laughs> song, right? It's a lot of confusion about that sound. Oh, That's right. Oh, my goodness. Oh, again, <laughs> in, um, in first grade yesterday, they were learning ing, and they kept saying ng. And I said, <laughs> honestly, do you all say thing? <laughs> you know? But they were, the bless, and which is natural, is trying to say both sounds in that digraph ng right. and and getting them to to really think about what what are you doing when you're making that sound what does it sound like in spoken words so that's that's another question that yesterday the teachers asked me and then they said we're not confident with all the sounds and i said say the words how do you say the words don't try to over say this sound but think of a list of words and you know just think about how many we have a number of words that end with ng so i've I've got to think about how do I say that? And I will tell you, um, depending on where you're on the country, people do. Uh, they do say long, right? Like an <laughs> island, right? Um, I so, see that on the Facebook groups all the time where yes. people, well, I say it this way and I say right. it this way. It's kind of and cool, actually, to hear. It is, it is cool <laughs> to hear. And then, but then I also say to teachers, I say, well, let's say it in a sentence. So um, the thing that was bothering me was the ringing of the phone. So did I say the thing that was bothering me was the ringing of the phone. You know, it's like you honestly in running speech, when you put words into a phrase or a sentence, it's easier to think about how do I say that than just saying the single word. Right. That's really helpful. I feel like we sometimes get caught up on that in speech. I, you, Cause you said, you know, like you said, the dialects everywhere are so different and uh, mm-hmm. yeah, we were at plain talk last week as, as for you and yeah. a lot of lovely Southern accents. And uh, yeah, I'm sure if we just said one word, it would be very different <laughs> than yes. if we stood up and all read a sentence together. Right. Right. And, and even the vowel sounds, which, which really tend to um, be the, the thing that changes in dialect and um how we pronounce words in the Northeast, how you all might pronounce a word. I might say it a little differently here. And the most common example we use, because I'm in Oklahoma, so definitely much more Southern. Um, but in Oklahoma, we say we, we say to our kids, get in the car, get, get. right? G-I-T, <laughs> get. get in the car. And um, so we don't say get, um, and, and, um, 10 is always the one that we, the, that, but the short, you're going to say pin and pen, pen and pen, right. <laughs> um, a, a pen that I write with is the same thing as the pen that I, uh, I push <laughs> into the wall, but I know the difference. Right. And, and that <laughs> dialect has a lot to do with that. And it's almost like once you know the difference, then you can play with it even more, right? Yes. It makes it more usable rather than less usable. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. Yes. And, and being able to appreciate. And, you know, the ultimate goal is that my children, my students can read multisyllabic words because I, if once I start to grow my, my knowledge and my phonic skills and I master those decoding skills or that one side of the simple view, the bottom strands of the rope, you know, the once those become automatic, I don't have to keep my longer words, longer text, developing my background knowledge, my vocabulary, so I can make the inferences and all of those things that they, they play together. But our, our goal is to get our kids to that as quickly as possible and and truly, you know, mid-year, second grade, end of second grade, if I can get my kids really moving in that direction, they're ready to start really growing their content knowledge even more on their own. So I'm reading independently, right? So speaking of these language variations that we were just talking about, I'm also wondering about English learners, right? So students who are coming in with a whole different language than English, would a sound wall still be helpful? I'm assuming yes, (laughs) but I'd love to hear your reasons for for why. Thank you so much for asking that question. And um, as I've said a couple of times, my colleague Antonio Fierro and I really worked on developing sound walls together. 
The reason being, Antonio is a Spanish speaker and really has worked so intensely to help teachers understand how to support our EL kids in classrooms and doing that work in phonology and ortho. 22 sounds in the language. And you heard me say in English, there's 44. So realizing, and I'm, I'm going to jump to the vowels now, and in Spanish, and, and this is the insight that Antonio's given me. Again, um, this is taught throughout the letters course. And, um, and as Antonio is in the instructor in the online por portion of, of that, but helping teachers to understand my Spanish speaking children, and, and we use Spanish because that's, that tends to be the highest number of our EL students in our classrooms. There are multiple languages and we recognize that. But in Spanish, um, just, uh, and I always say to teachers, how do you say yes in Spanish? Everybody knows how to say yes in Spanish. Si. Si. Right? So how do you spell that vowel sound? You spell it with an I. Mm -hmm. In Spanish, I represents E as in equal and cheese. But in Spanish, I don't have an I sound or an I sound. So when my children who are Spanish speakers see the word IT, it, they say eat because it's the closest right. sound next to the, to the I sound. E, I. Those are, so um, one, appreciating why my Spanish speakers keep saying the E sound because I don't have I. And you have to teach me the I sound. And that's going to take multiple repetitions to build that neural network in order to develop a new phonology in my brain. And Antonio says, you know, Spanish speakers, that neural network is even thicker and broader and wider because they've got, you know, now I'm, I'm developing a second language. I'm, I'm becoming uh, bilingual. And then, of course, we encounter people who are trilingual, multilingual students, which is, is fabulous. But appreciating the fact that um, my students um, don't have all of those sounds in, in their own language and, and being able to support that. And so we've written a lot about that in our Soundwall um, manual so that teachers can gain insight into what sounds don't exist for my Spanish speakers and what do I need to do to support them? So there's five vowel sounds in Spanish. There's 18 vowel sounds in English. So just instructionally oh, wow. <laughs> thinking about, and, and again, not saying it louder, right? <laughs> But, but having more practice and really zeroing in on those phonemes and, and helping our students um, develop that awareness. And I'll use another example that I use with my Spanish speakers. Oftentimes, our Spanish speakers will say cheese instead of cheese. Mm. Well, the letter Z exists in Spanish, but it's the S sound as in sun. So they say cheese instead of cheese. And we notice those things, but we don't ever think about why do they do why? that? Why does that happen? Because I don't have the z sound. Can I teach it to them? Yes. Do we have to practice it? And then I have to create that awareness of when is it the z sound and when is it the s sound? So that, much more complicated. <laughs> it's much more complicated. It is. And then, and then thinking about there is no other language that has the exact same phonology as English. And I might not know anything about the language of one of my students that comes into the classroom, let's say from the Marshall Islands, right? They have a different, they have a different set of phonemes in their language. And I don't have to know all the phonemes in their language. But knowing the phonemes in our language and making sure that I'm teaching those and practicing those and putting the print with them so they can begin to read words, then I'm really starting to build that for them. And I, I, we have so many schools that have EL teachers that don't necessarily speak the language that they're working with with their ELs, but giving them insight into this also. And that's, that's one of Antonio's goals. There's, we, we know we have to build vocabulary and background knowledge with those students, as we do with all children, but we also have to build the phonology and the orthography because, again, even in Spanish, they have some letters in their alphabet that we don't have in our alphabet. So, um, thinking, keeping in mind those things. And, um, also just, you know, I, when I'm talking about EL students thinking about, um, I'm going to jump from 
from phonology to syntax, but the syntax of language, I, I just have to throw this in when I'm teaching sound walls with teachers and talking about these things that um, in Spanish, the words don't, don't go in the same order as they do in English. And we oftentimes don't think about that as teachers, especially with our little ones that are coming in and, and how they hear. Um, and I always use the example of um, Casa Blanca, the, the house white, but we would say white house, right? And so mm -hmm. just the adjectives and, and the nouns, they go in a different order. And, and realize, it's not that they don't have the words, but now I'm having to do double double work thinking about the sounds and the order of the words. So, I mean, those are all important things in learning about the layers of our language. Such a good point. And you mentioned that you wrote about this in, I'll say a manual. It's it's the Kid Lips manual. Am I correct? Yes. Yes. Tool, tools for reading with a tools number four reading. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> that's great. Do you want to share anything else about that? I think that's really helpful for teachers. Like this is a reliable source. You are a reliable source. Um, if they, they're looking to try this out, I have it up. Is the whole set Kid Lips picture cards look, look to be $47 and then there's a manual. Um, yeah. So that, I mean, very affordable. Um, yeah. And, you know, something and that's the graphemes in the graphemes, the spelling patterns and keywords that go with them. Okay. So we put all that in, in a, in a sound wall kit for teachers to, to pick up, but it, yeah, the, the manual is designed for teachers to be able to pick up and we have a scope and sequence for teachers to follow in there. It's, um, it's optional. We also encourage teachers follow your phonics scope and sequence when teaching sound walls. But the other thing that happens in kindergarten, I'm not teaching all the sounds, right? Be oh, I'm not, I'm sorry. I'm not teaching all the, all the spellings for the sounds, but it's not unusual for me to go to, into a kindergarten classroom and hear teachers say, let's tap the sound, segment the word book, right? So what's the middle sound in book? It's the uh, mm -hmm. uh. Uh, I'm not teaching my kids to read and write with O, O in kindergarten, but I can talk about that sound and I can talk about the uh sound and we can talk about words that have that uh sound. In first grade, I am going to introduce that spelling. But if I already have the phonology for that sound, and I and this is what I feel like is so important for kids, is that there's a sound and if there's a sound, there's a spelling for it. They can begin to make that connection and um, understand, you know, if I, if I know these sounds, then I can, I can figure out how I make a close approximation of how to spell them. They might not be exact, especially with vowels every time, but at least I, I can get close to what that spelling is. And if I know the uh sound exists and I, um, I might not know how to spell it, but um, I, I realize that it's, it can't just be O. Oh, Right. And, mm -hmm. um, but there's got to be something more to the spelling. And I will tell you, I, I had a teacher tell me when her son was writing the Christmas list and she, she used sound walls in her classroom and the kindergarten, um, kids did too. This was the first grade teacher. And she said, my kid's not that smart, but it was so funny. He's writing his Christmas list and on his list, he wants boots. So now we're talking the ooze sound. But, um, <laughs> he said, um, he writes the B and I'm watching him and he's saying, Ooh, Ooh, Ooh. And then he writes, Oh, Oh. And she says, Parker, how did you know to write that? And he said, well, we learned about Ooh in our classroom and moon Ooh. And I looked under the sticky note to see how you spell it. <laughs> Took a, peek, took a peek. <laughs> so, so now kids are curious and they're trying yeah. to figure out like, there's a spelling for this sound. I'm going to look to see because I, I want to, I want to write a word that has this sound, but I can check and figure it out on my own. You know, he's going to remember that because he right. figured that out. Yeah. Right? I love that. And so, yeah, all these things, keeping it simple, keeping it straightforward. And I think one more thing that I just want to say about classroom instruction is teachers kind of freak out over now, do I have to spend 10 or 15, 20 minutes working with sound walls in my class? No, sound walls should be part of your phonemic awareness lesson. When I'm talking about doing phonemic awareness, I should talk about some of my phonemes. How do I produce those phonemes? Because many of the um, 
the materials that we use in classrooms now are lots of exercises that intersperse all of the sounds. They don't focus on single sounds. And um, so, you know, being aware, I'm exposing my kids to all this, but why wouldn't I teach the sounds? We do exercises and we manipulate sounds, put in a sound, take out a sound, but we never teach the sound. So this is the teaching this is what we call the warm up before the workout. I'm going to teach yeah. them and warm them up, talk about the phonology, and then we're going to do our phonemic awareness activities. And then I'm going to move into phonics instruction. And all that time I'm referring back and forth to the sound wall, but it's not just something that I teach just as a separate piece of my daily reading program. It's something that should be integrated. Yeah. Integrated. I remember we had um, <laughs> Lindsay Kemeny on and she said the same thing as a teacher. Right. She said, I don't, it, it, the sound wall is not my lesson, she said, but it is a tool that is, she actually said it's there for throughout the entire day of her lessons, yes. whether they're, they're writing, they're talking about phonics, they're talking about phonemic awareness. She said, it's just always there as a tool, as you, you need it as a teacher, as students need it for what they're doing. It's always there. And yeah. I love that. Which makes a lot of sense if we go back to what you shared earlier, Mary, that the, you know, if, if we're thinking about sound walls, then we're thinking about phonology, sound, orthography, spelling patterns, and morphography meaning, then we're using it all throughout our day in all subject areas. I mean, I even imagine putting words up from content areas when right. we have those beginning sounds that make sense, right, with what we've learned. And even some that we haven't, maybe they're covered. And then curious students are going up and Right. <laughs> pulling our post-its up if they want to use them in their writing. I just, it's, it's such a great tool to use throughout your day. Um, that has such a big, big benefit. And as a teacher who, uh, you know, was required to use word walls back in the day and really had no idea how to, how to really use them effectively, but tried really, really hard. This actually makes so much more sense. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think once people get past the fear of like, I don't know what to do with all that, yeah, right. but, but um, slowly introducing and, and really thinking about and and I'm going to jump back to if I'm, if I decide to put up a sound wall this now in January or February, it's we're in February, aren't we? Um, and, and bringing up, uh, putting that up, um, not being terrified of it, but um, learning it with your students keeping graphemes covered that you haven't taught your students yet, because that's a lot of information for them to take in. Um, but learning it with your, with your kids as you, as you begin to, to set them up. Well, Mary, we cannot thank you enough for sharing all of this information with us today, teaching us some new things, which was really cool. <laughs> um, and, and I know this will be really helpful for all of those teachers out there who are already implementing sound walls or thinking about it. So thank you so much. Thank you both for inviting me to be here today. I love, I love talking about these things. So thanks so much. Thank you. Okay.